Well, good morning, church. Big thanks to David Duncan, who preached in my stead last week while I was away. We're in this series called Seek Ye First, and really, we're just trying to keep the main thing the main thing, the priority of the kingdom of God when there's a lot of competition with the kingdom of God, uh, especially in the next few weeks. And so we'll get into that series in just a minute. It will be in Matthew 20, if you want to turn your Bible there. You might have seen in the church email this week, there is a Holy Land interest meeting a week from today, which is true. That is going to happen a week from today at 3 o'clock in A122. But I first want to say, uh, first and foremost, we need to be praying for peace in the Middle East. It seems like every uh, other day there's a huge uh, new event happening over there, and the war is, is not over at all. And we need to pray about the humanitarian crisis, about the hostages. We need to pray that the, the recent deaths of, of several leaders of Hamas can lead towards uh, resolution and not continued escalation. So that's primarily, I, I believe, what we should be praying for that part of the world. Having said that, for years, Stafford North led trips to the Holy Lands, and his son David and wife uh, Beverly also helped in those trips as well. It's been a long time since Memorial Road had a trip to the Holy Lands. And when we do tra- take trips like this, it takes about 18 to 24 months of lead-up time because it is such a, a big undertaking. And so we do want to go ahead and have an interest meeting for a, a trip potentially in 2026, possibly 2027, uh, if, if things get safer. Obviously, if they don't get safer, we would not take the trip. So, if you're interested in a Holy Lands uh, tour trip that would be led by David North and myself, then you are welcome to come to our preliminary meeting a week from today at 3 o'clock. So, something odd happened in the Olympics a few months ago in the doubles tennis uh, tournament. Rafael Nadal and Carlos Alcaraz, two of the most famous tennis players in the world, were playing doubles in the fourth round against two unknown Americans. And very late in the match, the Americans were serving. And if you've never watched a tennis match, there's, the crowd is obviously very into it, but there, there's just an etiquette of the crowd. There are certain times when you don't cheer, and one of those times is right before the person's about to serve. So there was this really interesting moment where the American guy was about to serve it, and the crowd erupted into applause and cheers, and it was sustained. 20, 30 seconds, the crowd was just going crazy, and the official kept trying to quiet the crowd down, but they wouldn't quiet down. And even the commentators were like, what is going on? The crowd should not be cheering at this point. Well, if, if you did not follow the story, here's why they were cheering. Leon Marchand, the French phenom, had just won the gold medal in the 200-meter butterfly, and everybody had their phones out, and they were watching that event. When you pause and think about it, we really are living in an unprecedented era of human history. If you could take a time machine back 500 years, and you could go up to Martin Luther as he's nailing those 95 theses on the door of the Catholic Church, and you could say, hey, you can actually watch Michelangelo paint the Sistine Chapel here on this glowing rectangle, Martin Luther would have thought, you're crazy. Like, he would have thought, what, what is this sor- sorcery? What is this magic? That no one would have thought we could do this, be in two places at the same time. Technology has given us the ability to know more about the world than we ever have at any given moment. Technology has given us the ability to be anywhere at any time, at least through a screen, and it has allowed us this strange dichotomy of being in one place physically, but in a totally different place mentally. What do you think the cost is of not being where you are? What's the downside of having your attention wrapped up in people that you'll never meet, in places that you'll never go, and problems that you personally cannot solve. What does that do to us? One of the books I read earlier this year was called Party Crasher by Joshua Butler. 
And he tells this really interesting story in, the, in this book about his friend Jim. So Jim is at lunch with a buddy, and they're having this incredible conversation about foreign policy. And over the course of this long lunch, they talk about Iran's nuclear capacity, the ethics of drone warfare, the Lebanese economy, the role of nationalism in Turkey's latest coup attempt. And Jim got pretty charged about several of these issues because he cared about these issues. And at one point, Jim's buddy asked him about his local city council members. And Jim was embarrassed because Jim didn't know any of them. And the conversation really got Jim thinking, and he later shared this story with the author of the book, Josh. And so this is a statement from Jim in the book. I had spent the last two hours pontificating about peace in the Middle East, but I had no clear vision about how to seek peace in my own city. I was name dropping the head of Turkey's Kumharyat party And yet I was one of those people who could not name a single member of my local government. Have you ever felt that way? This actually happened in a smaller scale to me a few weeks ago. I've been reading a lot about politics on a national level really all year in many ways just to get ready to hopefully have one or two helpful things to say to us as a church family. But a friend asked me a few weeks ago about a a pretty significant local event, something that happened to a student about a mile from my house. And he brought it up, and I didn't know anything about it. And it caught me off guard, because I, I, I tend to think that being educated about issues is really important. And it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to know what's going on on the, on the national level, because that allows us to have meaningful conversations. But when I didn't know about what was going on in my own city, I realized maybe I, maybe I was missing something. So sometimes when I read Scripture, I wonder how much the people in Jesus' day knew about what was going on in the wider world. There's not a whole lot of references in the New Testament to the politics of the world in that day, which, to be honest, is actually pretty astonishing when you really think about it. These documents, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and James, and First and Second Corinthians, they're written against the backdrop of the most prolific empire of their day, and arguably the most dominant empire in the history of the world, Rome. And there were things happening all the time in the big national scale. So, for example, in AD 23, Emperor uh, Drusus Julius Caesar died this mysterious death, likely from poison. Or in AD 31, this is right when Jesus was in the thick of his ministry, Emperor Tiberius' closest confident, confidant committed treason and was executed. So there were all sorts of stuff going on. There were power struggles, there were battles, there was new laws, there were taxes all the time. But I'm curious, what What did this really mean to Philip and Thomas and Peter and Andrew? What what did they think about these matters? What did Jesus think about these matters? I mean, there's a few things here and there. We know from Luke 2, there's a census. People aren't really happy about that. We know in Luke Luke 13, there's there's a national tragedy where a tower falls over. But these are always just passing references. And so how did how did Jesus interpret? all of these things. Well, in Matthew 20, I I do think we get at least a clue into how how Jesus interpreted what was going on in the bigger picture. It's actually a very famous teaching. This is right after James and John have just asked Jesus for positions of power. And in verse 25, Scripture says this, Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their officials exercise authority over them. So first of all, notice these two little words, you know. As in Jesus is saying, you're aware of what's going on here. So this does tell us a little bit about the knowledge base of the disciples of the Roman world. Of course they knew how rulers ruled. They would, they would know 
about the betrayal of Julius Caesar in 44 BC by Brutus. They would know about Tiberius and Herod and all the sorts of terrible things that they did. They, they understood power structure. This, I mean, Rome was so dominant in their day, and especially the social stratosphere. The, the Romans were up here, the Jews were down here, and so the disciples knew this, and they knew that empire thrived by the subjugation of the weak. But notice Jesus' exhortation. Not so with you. Like, you know this. You know what's going on up here, how they're treating each other, but not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So, like, what's the overall shift in this argument that Jesus is making? Jesus is saying, okay, uh, James and John, your mindset is here. You see the big, bad, powerful world of empire. You see the statues everywhere. You see the armor. You see the swords and the spears and the wealth and the power, and it's got into your bloodstream. You want to be on the winning team. You want to fight, and you want to be right. That's where James and John are. But Jesus is saying, you got to turn your focus And what I really want you to do is I want you to go serve somebody else. Not in the abstract, as in just think about how good it is to go help people. No, Jesus is saying, actually go find somebody. Go do something for somebody that you know. And and just to drive the point home, Jesus uses himself as an example. He's saying, I'm doing this. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve And the power of that example is that if if anybody could have had an excuse to go big picture and and even run for a political office, it would be Jesus. In fact, everybody was begging Jesus to do this. Jesus, would you just run for office? Would you just take over? Would you just go be the king? Would you just go overthrow the empire? And Jesus keeps saying again and again and again and again, well, I am going to take over, but it's not going to be through seizing power. It's going to be through serving people. So now let's go. Let's, let's wash feet, as in John 13. But then he's inviting his followers to also make this shift. James and John, you're up here. You see all the stuff going on in the big, bad political game, and you see the power, and you want it. But I'm telling you, go down here. Be last. Be a servant. So here's the big idea today. It's pretty simple. It's just two words. Love locally. And here, here's what I mean. Starting with me, I'm ex- exhorting all of us to confront our obsession with the national at the expense of the local. Is the national picture important? Absolutely. Will this election have implications for the future of the country? Absolutely, yes, it will. But is the national picture so important that it should take 95% of our mental and emotional energy. That certainly was not the case for Jesus Christ. In fact, if you start looking for it, you'll notice just how local the Bible is from start to finish. For example, Old Testament, Joshua 24, Joshua says these words, "'Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve.'" Whether the gods of your ancestor, that your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. In other words, I can't control which gods my neighbors bow down to. And I can't control the worship decisions of the, the nation of Israel, but what I can control is my own home, my own household. And so Joshua even makes this shift as a leader from Big picture to small picture. As for me and my household, here's what we're going to do. Or look at this Psalm 101. This is a kingly psalm. David's in charge. He's on the throne. He can do anything he wants. But he says this, I will conduct the affairs of my house with a blameless heart. I will not look with approval on anything that is vile. So David's the king over the whole nation at this point. And there's a lot 
that's going on in the nation that he can't micromanage. But what he is saying is that in my house, with my people, I'm not going to set my eyes before any vile thing. So again, he's going from big picture to small picture. He's choosing to focus on what is local. Or again, look at one more. I was reading this recently in my own prayer time. Luke 16, this really interesting story of the rich man and Lazarus. If you haven't read it in a while, it goes something like this. There's, uh, Jesus tells this story. There's two people. There's a rich man and there's a poor man named Lazarus, and they both die. And the rich man goes to Hades, and the poor man goes to Abraham's side, and they have this strange conversation across this chasm in the afterlife. Verse 3, verse three in Hades where he, the rich man, was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received his bad things, but now he's comforted here and you are in agony. So then as the story continues, the rich man asks God to send Lazarus back from the dead to warn his brothers so that the brothers won't also go to Hades. But Abraham replies with a really interesting phrase, well, if they don't believe Moses and the prophets, then they're really not going to even believe if somebody rises from the dead. It's such an interesting story. And there's so many layers to work through, especially on the, what the current Jewish view of the afterlife was at this time. But in this story, it's important to remember that Jesus is not actually giving an hour-long lecture about the afterlife. It's a short indictment on a particular kind of sin. And so I was reading this story over and over and over, just really praying, asking God the question, what's, what is the sin that, that Jesus was calling out in this story? Well, see if you can pick it out. I'll start reading in verse 19. This is the introduction of the story. It's all in the intro if you read it carefully. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores. Okay, so what's the indictment here? Is it, is it just with being rich? Not necessarily. The indictment is those three little words, at his gate. So notice the rich man was not being called out for something that was happening thousands of miles away. The rich man was being called out for something that was happening in his own front yard. So again, we're called to something local. In fact, we're called to follow Jesus where we are, not where we're not. There's lots of problems that are happening thousands of miles away. Aren't you glad that God's there? Because you're not. Same thing with Matthew chapter 25. Famously, the people say to Jesus, like, when did we see you in prison? And when did we see you sick? When did we see you hungry? And Jesus says, well, whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. So where are these people actually going? The, the, The listeners of Jesus in Matthew 25, where are they going to find the sick and the incarcerated and the hungry, they're going to their own zip code. We love Jesus by loving local. So here's a pop quiz. And don't feel bad if you don't know this because I didn't know it either. There's a really, really big vote coming, not November 7th, which is the national election. But November 5th, does anybody know the big vote on November 5th? Some of you do. I hear some, some murmurings. It, it's very important to this city. It's a big vote for, for Edmund. It's called Edmund on the Go. So if you didn't know, here's, here's what it is. It is being proposed that we raise property taxes for the next 10 years, just a little bit, to fund $231 million that will go towards parks and road improvement. Now, some of you knew about this, but many of you did not know 
about this. Now, for those of you that did not know about it, why did you not know about it? Well, one, you're busy, and I get that. You have lots of things going on. But another reason is that the national picture is so consuming that we have very little energy left to even know what's going on in our own city. But, but here's the irony. When you do the math, in which picture does your voice actually carry more weight? You in America is one over millions, if you do the fraction. But you in your city is one over thousands. So you actually have more weight when, you're, when it comes to your voice when, when you think about the local picture. So C.S. Lewis was criticized in his day for not paying enough attention to the national news about the war. And people got onto him, what are you doing? You got to stay informed. And here was his response to his critics. He said, to strive to master what will be contradicted the next day, to fear and hope intensely on shaky evidence is surely an ill use of the mind. That last line is really helpful to me. Of all the things that one could do with the gift of the mind, there are better uses than to simply fixate on events of which you can impact so little. And so Lewis is a great example of this. One of the most brilliant minds that has ever lived, part of the reason that he was able to write so prolifically is because he didn't spend 95% of his mental and emotional energy in a time when the world was at war on the national picture. Lewis puts this same idea in in the words of Chief Demon Screwtape in the book Screwtape Letters. So remember, remember on Screwtape Letters, it's reversed. So this is a demon talking about how to tempt a Christian. So here's what Lewis says in this book. There is no good at all in inflaming the Christian's hatred of Germans if at the same time a habit of charity is growing up between him and his mother or his employer or the man he meets in the train. So in other words... What Lewis is getting at is this, Satan is delighted when we're fueled with anger and rage and opinions and soapboxes about situations happening thousands of miles away because then we won't have time to love our mother and our boss and invite our Uber driver to church. And so the antidote is to simply look where we are, to love locally. So here's some good news. Three weeks ago, Memorial Road went, went local. And in a few weeks, with Thanksgiving Day in the city, we're going to go local again. So a few weeks ago, here's some stats about what our church family did with Word on the Street. We built 22 beds for children. We made 70 meals for needy families. We packed 42 uh, weekly food packs and 100 uh, toddler snack, snack packs for the Infant Crisis Center, and we put, 40, we put 90 food boxes together for Lilyfield. Now, those stats, they're not going to make the news. They're not, like, going to make you excited. They don't make your heart race, like, wow, those, that's, that's fantastic. We fed all these people and helped all these kids. But here, I was really thinking about these stats this week, and I thought, the more and more I read Scripture, I actually think God cares about those stats. I couldn't sleep last night. If you can tell by my voice, I'm, I'm coming off a, a sickness. I was having a terrible time, time sleeping last night, so I was reading a little bit of the intro of Isaiah. And I was just reminded the news that reaches heaven is the outcry of the weak. And so I do think God cares that three weeks ago we, we helped all these kids in our community. One of my good friends is Lance Towers, who often leads communion thoughts in second service. And, but we were, we were taking a walk recently, and, and uh, I was venting just about my own anxiety, and I was stressed out about several things. I was ta- actually talking about this series a little bit, and I was talking just about the, the tension in the country. Now, so many people are angry at each other, and there's so much tension and anger, and it's filtering down, and it's making me stressed out to even preach about these things, and I just vent and vent and vent and vent, and I was totally in the talking about things that were happening thousands of miles away. And so finally, I said, uh, well, what about you, Lance? How are you lately? 
And he said, wonderful, God has brought me a new friend named Guthrie. I said, well, tell me about that. And so he started talking about Lance volunteers as a buddy for our journey land. And Guthrie is an elementary age kid that's his new friend. And I was so (laughs) inspired by Lance talking about his new friend that I asked if Guthrie, Guthrie's parents would let him be on a very short uh, video so that you could see this new friendship. And so they agreed. And so here's a short clip of Lance and his new friend, Guthrie. Hi, church family. My name is Mr. Lance. I'm here with Guthrie. Guthrie and I come to church here because we want to grow in love for Jesus. And we also want to grow in our love for each other. We are finding that to love each other, we need to know each other. And we want to invite you into knowing us a little bit as well. Can you tell us your favorite color? Blue. It's mine too. Who do you live with? For me, the answer is my wife, Holly, and my kids, Olivia, Lewis, and Hudson. Guthrie, can you tell us who you live with? Mom, Dad. Very good. My other question is, what is the name of your dog? And I don't know if I've told you this, but my dog's name is Fluff. Guthrie, what's the name of your dog? Ollie. Ollie. It's a good name. One last question. Where is your favorite place to shop? Mine is the Scheidler Wheeler Thrift Store. What about you? Grocery. Grocery store. Very good. <laughs> Let's give a round of applause for Lance and Guthrie. <clears throat> I just, it really warmed my heart, and it was, it, it was centering to me. To, oh, yes, that's, that's what Jesus called us to do, is to find your neighbor and your classmate and the person that sits in the cubicle next to you and, and just love those people. That's what we're called to do. And, and if we do that, especially over the next few weeks, we're going to be more grounded than the rest of the world, which is going to be very, very shaken by, by what, whatever happens uh, in the election the next few weeks. And here, the good news is we are good at this. Like, yes, this is an exhortation of a sermon, but we're, we are good at loving locally. So I've told this story, I think once, but it was several years ago. I was at a uh, preacher's luncheon from lots of preachers of lots of different uh, churches and denominations around the area. And I met this guy who preaches at a different church down the road. And he asked me, well, where I preach? I said, well, I preach at the Memorial Road Church of Christ. And he turned to me and he says, I've got a bone to pick with you. I was like, whoa, that was aggressive. And he said, I live in the Smiling Hills neighborhood and I am sick of your members. And I was like, oh no. Like I'm thinking, you know, someone's speeding by in a church van or something. I don't know what's going on. And he says, you guys are so ridiculously nice. And I'm trying to invite people to my church. Nobody's going to come to my church because all your members are just, they're just nice to everybody. I was like, I didn't know what to say to that. Like, I'm sorry. And he just goes on. He keeps ranting. He was like, I was out trying to fix my weed the other day. I just pulled in the cord and it wouldn't start. I'm just trying not to cuss. And one of your members comes over and he's like, would you like this plate of freshly baked chocolate chip cookies? I'm like, hey, I don't know what to say. That's Memorial Road for you. So all I'm saying is we are good. We are good at this. But don't let the anxiety and the attention and the anger of the world pull us away from our latent strength. We can do this. But this is just a reminder, love, love locally. You know what the Gentiles do, how they lord it over people. You know, Jesus says, we all know how power works, but not so with you. If you want to be great... You go out there and you be a servant. So we're going to 
sing now. And if you have a pastoral need, our shepherds are going to be back in the atrium. They'd love to pray with you. If you'd like to get baptized, I'll meet you down front this morning. Let's stand and sing.